Hello, this is Dr. Hena Asil, and today we are doing uh, one of the past papers, the one in October 2021. Um, this is uh, Unit 2 of the Edexcel paper. This is the first question. You know that the exam is divided into sections. So in section A, we have multiple choice questions. The first question here says the infrared spectrum of an organic compound is shown. Which of these compounds would give this infrared spectrum? Okay, let us go over this again. If we're looking at the first choice, the first choice is hexanal, and hexanal means it's an aldehyde. We said aldehydes must have a suitable bond O. The suitable bond O should be around. 1700 we don't have any peak at around 1700 so this cannot be hexanal or hexanoic acid because both of them should have a suitable bond o at 1700 okay so we're left with hexane or hexanol you should realize that hexanol is an alcohol an alcohol would have a broad peak at 3000 and something so there should be a broad peak not that peak that appears there there should be a broad peak at 3000 and something usually around 3300 uh, we don't have that so this is definitely not an alcohol so the only option we have here is hexane and this is correct this should be hexane because this peak that you have at before 3000 is actually the peak for the CHs. So it is the CH uh, stretching vibration before 3000, not the OH for the alcohol. So this is the IR spectrum of hexane. Okay, the next question says which of these compounds does not react with acidified potassium dichromate remember potassium dichromate is an oxidizing agent it would react with a primary alcohol because we said a primary alcohol like ethanol in choice a that would uh, react with potassium dichromate and form an acid uh, the uh, option b is actually a secondary alcohol a secondary alcohol is oxidized to form a ketone so that would react also with potassium dichromate now choice c is an aldehyde and you should also know that an aldehyde would react with potassium dichromate to form acid but the last choice there is a ketone ketone cannot be further oxidized so this is the one that will not react with potassium dichromate okay which of these compounds is a tertiary alcohol well let's draw them out and see which one is a tertiary alcohol do you remember what is primary secondary and tertiary alcohol well this is the first choice that we have there to methyl propane to all so the OH is attached to a carbon that is attached to three carbons. This is a tertiary alcohol. So this is actually my answer. Uh, choice B is 3-methyl-butane-2-all. You should realize that 3-methyl-butane-2-all is a secondary alcohol. 2-2-dimethyl-propane-1-all. This would be a primary alcohol because the OH is attached to a carbon that is attached to only one carbon. 3,3-dimethyl-butane-2-all. Now, the OH is attached to a carbon that's attached to two carbons, so that is a secondary alcohol. Okay. Now, in a mass spectrum, the molecular ion is the ion which always has what? Remember that the mass spectrum we did in Unit 1, but it also applies to Unit Two. So whatever you did in unit one, you should remember for unit two. And you should remember that the molecular ion peak is the one with the highest mass over charge ratio. For example, if this is a 
mass spec of a compound, for example, pentene, then the molecular ion peak is the one with the highest mass over charge. So that is the uh, what we call the parent ion at 72 here, for example, this would be the molecular ion peak. The next question says butane 1 all and butane 2 all are isomers. Which m over z value would be expected to have a significant peak in the mass spectrum of butane 1 all, but not that of butane 2 all? So let's first draw them butane 1 all and butane 2 all. And then you know that the m over z values we have for different peaks are due to different fragmentation. So for example, if I look at this part, this part has a mass over charge of 15, carbon is 12 plus three hydrogens, that's 15. This also is present in the other isomers. So A is present in both, 15 is present in both. What about 29? What is 29? 29 is if I take these two carbons with their hydrogens, that's another fragment. It is also present in this other one. So both of them will have a peak at 29. Now, 43 is if I have this uh, three carbons in the butane one all, but for the butane 2 all, I cannot possibly have a fragment that is 43. So the one that would be present in butane 1 all and not 2 all is the, the peak at uh, 43. 57 would be if I take the four carbons with their hydrogens. This would also apply to the same fragment in butane 2 all. So the only one that is in one and not the other is the, frag the peak at 43. Okay, this one says which of these isomers has the highest boiling temperature? Again, remember, how do we decide which one has the highest boiling temperatures? First of all, number of carbons. If they are different, then the one with more carbons will have higher boiling point. So let us see. These are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. All of them have 6 carbons. So they're not, the number of carbons is not what is different about them. It is the branching or the straight chain. Remember, if I have the same number of carbons, then the straight chain, which is like A, is the one that will have a higher boiling temperature than the branch chain with the same number of carbons. And this question says organic reactions can be classified in different ways. How should this reaction be classified? Okay, he starts with a double bond and he ends up with an alkene. That means that what he did was an addition reaction in which he reacted the double bond with hydrogen, H2. The double bond opened up and the hydrogens were added to the carbon, so we end up with an alkene. How should the reaction shown be classified? He's changing an alcohol into a ketone. Remember, to change an alcohol into a ketone, that is an oxidation reaction in which we add an oxidizing agent such as potassium dichromate. Data for some group 1 and group 2 cations are shown. Which cation would be expected to form the nitrate with the greatest thermal stability. Do you remember what we said about uh, thermal stability of nitrates, carbonates, sulfates, and so on? We said nitrate is a big uh, atomic group. If it is with another big cation, then they will be very stable and they will not be easily broken. So the one with the thermal stability would be the one that has the biggest ionic radius, that would be Z. The equation for complete combustion of propane 1 all is shown, and he says this amount of moles of propane 1 all undergoes complete combustion. What mass of carbon dioxide is formed? So this is chemical calculation. Remember, he's giving me the number of moles of propane 1 all. So the first thing I do is I look at the equation. 
he's asking about carbon dioxide so i relate from the equation it says one mole of propanol will give three moles of carbon dioxide that means the number of moles of carbon dioxide is three times the number of moles he gives me for propanol then to get the mass you know that mass is number of moles times the molecular mass so if you do the calculation this should be the answer here he's given me an equation and he's trying to tell me to balance well if you sit down and try and balance this equation you will find that you will need five in front of the h2c2o4 uh, y is three in front of the h2so4 this is simple balancing and the water will have an a in front what is the reducing agent in the reaction well the reducing agent is the one that becomes oxidized so let's look at this equation again this was the equation which one became oxidized it is the c2o4 that uh, was oxidized to carbon dioxide and uh, the others were reduced remember that potassium manganate is an oxidizing agent and anything that reacts with an oxidizing agent would be the reducing agent. What is the oxidation number of phosphorus in the phosphate ion? You remember how to calculate oxidation number? We said each oxygen has uh, minus two, so the four oxygens will be minus eight. Now, how much is the phosphorus so that you have an overall of minus three? Remember that it has a 3 minus on it, so the overall uh, should be minus 3, so that means my phosphorus must be 5, so that I get an overall of minus 3. Which reaction is not a redox reaction? Remember, if it is an acid, first of all, acid and base can never be a redox. So if, any, if he's saying which one is not a redox, well, you look for which one is... Uh, acid plus base because acid plus base to give salt plus water is a neutralization reaction uh, all the other options that are given here are redox reactions a student is provided with this of hydrochloric acid what volume of distilled water should the student add to the solution to make a 0.05 mole per decimeter cubed of solution remember that when we do this we try to get first what is the number of moles that we have so that is the concentration times volume again remember the volume has to be in decimeter cubed so if he gives it in centimeter cubed i divide by a thousand so this means that now i have 0.025 mole of hydrochloric acid and what he's trying to do is i want to know what would be the total volume if the concentration is 0.05 so volume is number of moles over concentration i got that i have this number of moles now what would be the total volume i found that the total volume should be 500 centimeter cubed but he's saying what volume of distilled water should the student add to this he already has a solution that is 25 centimeter cubed so what volume of distilled water should i add from my calculation i should have a total of 500 but then i have 25 so i should add how much of water to the 25 i should add 475 of water to the 25 so that the total volume would be 500 and the concentration is 0.05 okay which statement about group 7 elements is not correct so he's saying boiling temperatures increases down the group yes that is correct we said as we go down we go from gas gas liquid solid and that means that the boiling temperature increases. reactivity increases no reactivity does not increase going down group seven we said in group seven the one up is more reactive so actually reactivity decreases as we go down the group what about the others first ionization energy decreases down the group yes we said the outermost electron is further away from the nucleus as we go down the group so the amount of energy needed to remove that outermost electron will be less and less as we go down 
Electronegativity decreases, that is correct. We said the one on top, fluorine, is the most electronic. This question says, when iodine is dissolved in a non-polar organic solvent, the solution formed is what? Remember that we said iodine as a solid is gray. Now, if I dissolve it in water, it is brown. If I dissolve it in nonpolar organic solvent, it is purple. And we said that actually the nonpolar organic solvent has lower density than water, so it will float on top of the water layer. Which row shows the hydrogen halides in order of increasing boiling temperatures? Again, when we talked about hydrogen halides, we said that the HF is the one that will form strong hydrogen bonds between the molecules in addition to the permanent dipole-dipole interactions and the London dispersion forces. So the HF has higher boiling temperature than all the other hydrogen halides. And then if I compare HCl, HBr, HI, as we go along, they, um, they have stronger uh, London dispersion forces between them since the halides become bigger and bigger with more electrons and so on. So we said the HCl, then HBr, then HI going from the lowest to the highest. So the answer is C. Okay. Solid potassium bromide reacts with concentrated sulfuric acid. Remember, we talked about chlorides, bromides, iodides reacting with concentrated sulfuric acid. We said if we have a chloride, it reacts with the concentrated sulfuric acid and give HCl. And that's it because the HCl is not a good reducing agent. Now, if we react with bromide, then we said the bromide will react with the sulfuric acid to give HBr, but then the HBr is a better reducing agent, so it further reacts with the sulfuric acid to form SO2 plus Br2. So the, what you don't get with the bromide is hydrogen sulfide. You get the hydrogen sulfide when we react it with iodide, because we said when the iodide reacts with the sulfuric acid, it gives HI. The HI is a very strong reducing agent, so it actually reduces the sul uh, sulfuric acid to SO2, I2, sulfur, and H2S. So the hydrogen sulfide H2S is obtained with the iodide, not with the bromide. Here he's saying 10 grams of hydrated magnesium sulfate is heated to remove the water of crystallization. What mass of anhydrous magnesium sulfate is formed? Okay, so how are we going to do this? He gives me 10 grams of hydrated magnesium sulfate. Now, if we have 246.4 gram per mole of the hydrated, it will have how much of the magnesium sulfate? It will have the uh, mass, the molecular mass of magnesium plus sulfur plus four of uh, oxygens. So the 246.4 grams, which is the total MR of the hydrated magnesium sulfate, will have a total of 120.4 grams of magnesium sulfate. So if I'm starting with only 10 grams, what would be the mass? I usually do this with a cross multiplication. So this will end up with 4.89 grams. Now this is section 2 and section 2 has short answers and he says this question is about enthalpy changes. An experiment was carried out to determine the enthalpy change of combustion for ethanol. 1.19 grams of ethanol was burned in a spirit burner. The heat energy from this combustion raised the temperature of 100 grams of water from 21.6 to 63.9. Calculate, first of all, the number of moles of ethanol. Of course, number of moles, how do we calculate it? It is mass over molecular mass, and he already gives me the molecular mass. So all I do is the mass that he gives me divided by the molecular mass, this gives me the number of moles of ethanol. Then he says, calculate the heat energy required to raise the temperature of 100 grams of water 
from 21.6 to 63.9. That means we're trying to calculate Q. You should remember that Q is equal to MC delta T. The M, please remember, the M represents the mass of water. So what is the mass of water? It's 100. C is always 4.18, whether he gives it to me or not, times the temperature difference. The, the usually the bigger minus the smaller whichever one it is and this gives you in this case the q is uh, first of all the q comes out in joules you can then divide it by a thousand so this gives you 17.68 kilo joules then he says use your answers to one and two to calculate a value for the enthalpy change of combustion of ethanol you know that the delta H or the enthalpy change of combustion would be the Q that we calculated over the number of moles. So the number of moles that we calculated in the previous question, we use that and that gives me a number. Remember that delta H must have a sign. How do I know the sign? He says above that the temperature was raised from 21.6 to 63.9. That means it is an exothermic reaction. When the temperature goes up, it is an exothermic reaction, and that means delta H has to be a negative number. The value of the enthalpy change of combustion from this experiment was very inaccurate. Give two reasons why this value was inaccurate, and you should remember that. We usually say incomplete combustion, so less energy is released, and some of the ethanol evaporates. Mean bond enthalpies can be used to calculate the value of the enthalpy change. Give the meaning of the mean bond enthalpy. Remember that this is the average energy required to break one mole of a bond of molecules in the gaseous state so this is a definition you have to be familiar with then he gives me some bond enthalpies and he says calculate the delta h for this reaction again you should remember how to use this to get delta h we said the ones in the reactants will be with a positive sign the ones in the products will be a negative sign and the delta h is the total of all that so it is the reactants minus the product. Look at all the bonds. We are looking at the bonds. So each value you multiply by the number of bonds. So we have CH is 413. How many CHs do I have? I have three. Plus I have a CO bond, which is 358, plus an OH bond, 464, plus one and a half of the oxygen double bond the oxygen bond so that is 498 the total of that for the reactants is this number then i do the same for the products i have two co bonds uh, that would be two times the value he gives me plus i have four oh bonds so that would be four times the 464 now, the delta H is the reactants minus products. This comes out to be minus 658 kilojoule per mole. Then he says enthalpy changes of combustion can be used to calculate the enthalpy change of formation of a compound. Remember, we said there is Hess's law or Hess's cycle, and we said uh, going from reactants to products one way has the same total enthalpy change as going through another pathway and this here he gives me this equation and he says uh, complete the Hess cycle and use it to calculate the standard enthalpy change of formation of ethanol so let us take a look at this remember that you look at the table what kind of information does he give me he gives me the standard enthalpy change of combustion so that means you need to look at each part of the equation and decide when we do combustion, what does it give me? So you should realize that carbons, I have two carbons, it will give two CO2s. Then I have uh, two hydrogens, it will give two water. 
Remember that you need to balance and you need to write the um, state symbols for the products in the box below. Then you can use this to calculate delta H. So he's saying, okay, what are we trying to do? We're trying to get the delta H for his reaction. Follow the arrows and you will find that the combustion for uh, from two carbons plus two hydrogens to give two CO2 plus two water, this is equal to the total on the other side. So the total of the 2C plus 2 hydrogen plus half oxygen to give CH3CHO and then going to the products down. So that is the delta H minus the delta H of combustion. Remember that the values in the table are given for one mole. So if I have two carbons, then I have to multiply that value by two. I have two hydrogens, I multiply the value by two of course there is no delta h of combustion for oxygen so using that to calculate for delta h we find that we get this number this question says um, the rates of hydrolysis of one chloropropane one bromopropane one iodopropane in reactions with aqueous silver nitrate were compared state what would be measured in the experiment to compare the rates of hydrolysis okay we're trying to determine how fast breaking c c l bond c b r bond c i bond uh, when we react it with silver nitrate remember that when we react all of these with silver nitrate they give precipitates so what we are measuring is the time taken for the precipitate to form state which of these halogenoalkanes will hydrolyze the fastest do you remember which bond will break faster you should realize that as we go down the group the iodopropane would break down faster it has the weakest bond with the lowest bond enthalpy the equation for hydrolysis of one chloropropane by aqueous hydroxide ions is shown give the mechanism for this reaction okay Mechanisms should involve curly arrows, dipoles, lone pairs. So this is basically the mechanism for a nucleophilic substitution. Can you see that? I am trying to replace the Cl with an OH. So we draw it out. Remember that the O of the OH minus has a lone pair of electrons. And these are the ones that would attack the slightly positive carbon. So you have dipoles on the ccl the carbon has slightly positive the cl has slightly negative and the oh minus attacks the carbon using the lone pair of electrons okay the boiling temperatures of some halogenoalkanes are shown explain the trend in boiling temperatures of these halogenoalkanes remember that the iodine atoms are larger as we go down with more electrons so the iodopropane has stronger London dispersion forces between the molecules. So more energy is needed to separate them. So they will have a higher boiling temperature. In another experiment, two bromobutane is heated with ethanolic potassium hydroxide. Remember, this is an elimination reaction. Remember that we have two types of reactions with potassium hydroxide. Either it is aqueous potassium hydroxide, and that is the one they just talked about, where I will replace the bromine with hydroxide ion. But if it is in ethanol, alcoholic potassium hydroxide, then it will be an elimination reaction in which I form the corresponding alkene. So he says, draw the skeletal formula of the three possible organic products giving their name. Okay, if we remove the bromine from the two bromobutane and we form butene, what kind of product can we have? Either it is like this, and this is but1ene, or it is but2ene. The thing is, but2ene can either be a cis or a trans, or what we call an E or a Z. So these are the three possible products from 
the uh, elimination reaction with 2-bromobutane. This question is about group 1 metals. When potassium is placed into a beaker of cold water, potassium hydroxide and hydrogen are formed. Write the equation for this reaction. Include state symbols. So this is potassium plus water to give potassium hydroxide plus hydrogen. Of course, it has to be balanced and don't forget the state symbol. This is a redox reaction. State which element is oxidized and which is reduced and justify by giving the initial and final oxidation numbers of any element that changes oxidation state. So which one is oxidized or reduced? Remember that the potassium is oxidized because it will change oxidation number from 0 to plus 1. The hydrogen was reduced because its oxidation number has changed from plus 1 to 0. The reaction of potassium with water is very vigorous and a flame is seen. What would be the color of the flame with potassium? It is lilac. Then this question says the label has come off a bottle known to contain M, a group 1 metal, which is stored in oil. A student carried out an experiment to determine the identity of M. A small piece of M was wiped with tissue paper to remove the oil. Remember that group 1 metals are very reactive and they have to be stored under oil so that they don't react with the water vapor or oxygen in the air. So he's saying a small piece of M was wiped with tissue paper to remove the oil. The piece of M was weighed, placed in a beaker of distilled water. After the reaction has finished, the contents of the beaker and washings were transferred to a 250 centimeter cubed volumetric flask. The solution was made up to the mark with the distilled water and mixed thoroughly. A pipette was used to transfer 25 centimeter cubed portions of this solution to conical flask. Each portion was then titrated with hydrochloric acid of concentration 0.4. Remember that you should know that when you put the M in water, it turns into M hydroxide, so that's a base, so he's titrating it with hydrochloric acid. So mass of metal is 0.37 grams. The mean of the hydrochloric acid uh, from the titration is 12.8 centimeter cubed. And the reaction taking place is the M hydroxide plus HCl to give MCl plus water. Now, the indicator used was phenolphthalein. So remember, he's putting phenolphthalein on the M hydroxide or the base. Remember that phenolphthalein in a base will start pink and then at the end point, once it is neutral, it becomes colorless. The question is, calculate the relative atomic mass of M and use it to identify which group 1 metal it is. Okay, how do we do this? He gives me mass of metal and the volume of hydrochloric acid needed. So the first thing that I need to do is get the number of moles of hydrochloric acid. We have the concentration of hydrochloric acid. He gives in the question was 0.4 times 0.0128. That is the volume divided by 1000 in decimeter cubed. So this is the number of moles of HCl. Then that means that this would be the same as the number of moles of the MOA, uh, the hydroxide of the metal. That means that the number of moles in the 250, you multiply by uh, 10, and that means this is the number of moles of the metal itself. So you can use that to get the MR of the metal, mass over number of moles. And that gives 7. So that means I'm looking for something that has a molecular mass of 7 point something. That means my metal is lead. Another student repeated the experiment using a different sample of metal M, but did not wipe off the oil before weighing it. Now state how this would change the calculated value of the relative atomic mass of M and justify your answer. Of course, if he does not wipe off the oil, that means he, the mass that he recorded is not really the mass of M. The mass of M will be lower than 
what he actually weighed, so the MR would be greater than it should be. This is the last section where he says this question is about ethanol and bioethanol. The main fuel used as a petrol substitute is bioethanol. Bioethanol is the ethanol that has been produced by fermentation. The starting material is usually some form of plant material rich in starch, so such as wheat, maize, or potatoes. Enzymes in yeast convert this material to simple carbohydrates such as glucose and then to ethanol and carbon dioxide. The mixture is left for several days until fermentation is complete. The percentage of ethanol is never greater than 15% because higher concentrations of ethanol would kill the yeast. A common blend of fuel is 95% petrol and 5% bioethanol. The engine does not need to be modified for this mixture. So, based on that, he's saying, give one advantage and one disadvantage of using bioethanol in petrol. So, remember that the advantage is that it is produced from renewable resources, but the disadvantage is I'm using of the land to produce uh, the, bio, the crops for the bioethanol instead of using it to produce food. Suggest so why this fermentation must be carried out in the absence of air. Remember that this process has to be in the absence of air, otherwise the ethanol would be oxidized in air and ethanoic acid will be formed instead of ethanol, or in order to provide an anaerobic uh, reaction for the yeast. Suggest so how the ethanol can be obtained after filtering the fermentation mixture. Remember that once we filter the fermentation mixture and get rid of the yeast, I now have a mixture of ethanol and water. So how do we separate it? By fractional distillation. Ethanol is hygroscopic, which means it readily absorbs water from the air. Give a possible reason why ethanol is able to absorb water. Remember that ethanol dissolves in water because ethanol forms hydrogen bonds with water. So just the problem arising from the hygroscopic nature of ethanol when using this fuel in a motor vehicle. So if I put this kind of fuel in the motor vehicle and it absorbs water, this would lead to less energy efficiency of the engine or you could say that the water would cause corrosion inside the engine. Ethanol can also be produced by hydration of ethene. Typical conditions are 300 degrees Celsius, 60 atm, with a catalyst of phosphoric acid. Explain why these conditions are used by describing the effect of changing the temperature and pressure on the rate of reaction, equilibrium yield, and cost. So this is a reversible reaction. So we have to consider the effect of each of these factors on the position of equilibrium and the yield and the cost of the reaction. So remember that we said the temperature, if it is high, this is for faster rate of reaction. But if I increase it much higher, this would be um, more expensive and would cause the point of equilibrium to shift to the left since the forward reaction is exothermic. This would produce less yield of ethanol. Now, a catalyst increases the rate of the reaction without affecting the point of equilibrium. If we are increasing the pressure, this is because increasing the pressure increases the rate and causes the equilibrium to shift to the right, so higher yield of ethanol is obtained. A much higher pressure would be more expensive. So basically, you should remember that we said we need to use a temperature that is high enough so that the rate of the reaction is not too slow. But I cannot use a very high temperature because the forward reaction is exothermic and a higher temperature will cause the reaction to move backward or shift to the left. And that means I will have less yield of uh, ethanol. Pressure, we said we need to use higher pressure because higher pressure will favor the side that gives less number of molecules. So in this case, when I use higher pressure, it will go to the right or it will go forward, give me more yield of ethanol. But I cannot use a much higher uh, pressure because using a high pressure is expensive.
The rate of this reaction is increased by using a catalyst, label the axis on the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve, and use it to explain how a catalyst increases the rate of the reaction. So he's saying that if I have this, where is the activation energy for a normal uh, reaction and the activation energy with catalyst? Remember that first of all, you need to label the axis, and the, label, the axis are number of molecules and energy. The activation energy with catalyst should be more to the left, and the explanation is a catalyst provides an alternative pathway with lower activation energy. That means more molecules have energy higher than the activation energy, so there will be more effective collision. Catalysts such as phosphoric acid are bonded to a support material that contains lots of pores. So just the advantage of using support materials containing lots of pores. Of course, if I put it like this, there is larger surface area, so there is faster reaction. Under these conditions, only about 5% of ethene is converted into ethanol as it passes over the catalyst. Now, so just how the overall yield of this process can be improved to make it economically viable. Remember that if we have this kind of reaction, we usually remove the product as it is formed. So I remove the ethanol as it is formed. This forces the reaction to go forward. And I recycle any unused reactants. So I take the unused reactants and pass it again over the catalyst to be reused. So that was the end of this paper. I hope it was useful to you and please follow for the rest of the past paper. Thank you.